Welcome back, everyone. We now have Dan Gifford, Senior Data Scientist at Getty Images, ready to share his information with you. Dan, take it away. Thanks so much. And yeah, welcome, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining today. Um, so as introduced, my name is Dan, and I'm coming from Getty Images. I'm going to talk a little bit about inclusive AI and the inclusive workflows around building that kind of AI. Um, so, you know, this is a this is an interesting topic. It's something that's I think important to a lot of us, and certainly has grown in the intensity that more people are thinking about it recently. Um, so, so let's get into it. Um, this is myself, um, and the reason I'm going to show you this picture is because we're going to start off with a bit of a pretest. Uh, based on what little you know about me in the few seconds that I've been talking. Um, in what city do you think I was born? How about my level of education? How about my gender? And what do you think is my favorite genre of music? Um, now, as a spoiler, I'm not going to give you the answers to any of these questions, and i um, not expecting any of you to guess them all right. But I'm using this exercise um, to sort of showcase something that is interesting about the human brain, and that's that all of you probably started thinking and developing stories um, about me um, as soon as the words began coming out of my mouth and you saw me on the screen. And this is fascinating. Our brains do this automatically without us even thinking about it. And this happens for actually a really good reason. Um, it, it's because humans are social creatures. We depend, our survival depends on us building relationships with those around us um, in order for us to grow and, and ultimately succeed. And the, this is, the reason that our brains do this automatically is because for a lot of human history, we have had to make these judgments and build these stories about the environments and people around us very quickly. Our survival actually depended on it. Um, you know, I needed to be able to tell, or we needed to be able to tell really quickly if the person that you're sort of interfacing with is someone you can trust, or if it's someone that you should be skeptical or wary of. And the your brain is doing this all the time without you even realizing it. And that's, that's positive in the sense that it helps us sort of form these stories. But of course, we also know that that can be negative, um, specifically what that can lead to, right? If you're using uh, information that you have built up over the course of your life to sort of build these stories, um, you'll start to attach meaning to things that might not actually be true. And this leads to things like stereotyping, and it can lead to things like sort of unconscious biases that sort of work their way into how we look at each other and, and sort of interface with the world. So it's helpful as if we're going to talk about something like bias and fairness that we sort of define what we mean by that. And there's lots of different ways that we can define bias, but this is just one you know, particular quote that I really like, which is, it's a system that unintentionally errs at different rates or in different ways between classes or users. This is a, I feel like a really good quote as it relates to machine learning in, in particular. Now, the key operating word here is unintentionally, right? Because it's totally okay and possible to have a system that errs at different rates or in different ways intentionally. And that is actually, you know, there's, there's great examples of that. Let's say you're building a translation app for language and uh, you're building something to translate between English and French. Um, and that is the intention. You've built it to do that and you've made that explicit. Well, if someone who is primarily Spanish speaking comes in and tries to use that application, it's not gonna work for them, it's gonna error, but that's intentional. However, if you were to build this application and sort of say this is a universal translation app and someone who is primarily Spanish speaking comes in to use it and notices that it doesn't work for them, this is an unfair experience and it's going to result in what appears to be a bias in the app and likely is um, based on the way that the designer actually built it. Now bias, there's all kinds of different biases that exist and I'm gonna list a few here, but it's useful to sort of go through a few just to remind us that, that there is a variety when we sort of bring up the concept of bias. You know, something like availability bias, this, an example of this would be, um, let's say, uh, you know, you have an uncle, which is, you know, they're 95 years old and they're a smoker. Well, okay, smoking must not be bad because, you know, I have this very old uncle that has been doing it his whole life. 
Um, well, that's information that's available to you, so it might be skewing your interpretation, right, of the data. Um, there's things like blind spot bias, which is what we typically talk about is failing to recognize a bias as a bias. There's confirmation bias related to, especially we talk about this around like the media and social media landscapes nowadays, where you sort of wind up in these bubbles of information where you're more likely to sort of trust information that already conforms to your priors and prior beliefs. Um, stereotyping, which I sort of tried to elicit from you in that pretest, right, where you sort of overestimate the importance of correlating features that you've sort of built up over your life or in machine learning has built up over the amount of data it's seen. Uh, and you sort of overestimate the importance of those when making future predictions. And then finally, things like survivorship bias. I'm sure many of you in this talk have, have seen the sort of classic World War II uh, bomber example with the bullet holes and sort of only getting information back from the planes that actually came back to the, the airstrip. Um, these are all different kinds of biases, and these are some of the most common ones that work their way into machine learning and, and AI in general, but of course, there's many more besides just these. So why does it matter, right? Why is this sort of, uh, why, why is this becoming this really hot topic to discuss now, and why are more and more industries sort of tackling this head on? And it's because we started to realize that biases are holding us back. They're holding us back from creating products that are fair and can be widely adopted, um, and it's holding us back from actually building things that are meaningful and valuable to everyone. Um, and we, you know, I think maybe thought, well, machine learning at first is this objective technology. It's learning from data. You know, humans aren't necessarily driving this sort of 100%. But now we know that's really not the case, right? Humans are involved at every stage of the development of AI and our biases sort of come across and can influence the AI because of that. And so we're realizing the amount of power as humans that we have in sort of influencing these technologies and where the subjective nature actually does come in. So 2020 comes along and if 2020 has shown us anything, it's that the world can change really, really rapidly. Now, what happens is when you have technology that exists in a rapidly changing world, um, you have to decide as the designer how quickly you want your technology to evolve with it, right? There's times when you might not want it to change and, and sort of become skewed super quickly by flashes in the pan or, or things that happen quickly. But certainly for many of the things that have happened this year, we might care a lot. And, and it's, you know, an example that we see at Getty Images is things around mask wearing and working from home, where we have lots of imagery from our photographers, and we've always had a lot of imagery with people wearing masks and surgical masks, and we've had lots of imagery of people working from home, but only in 2020 have those two things been related to one another. And so we are models that sort of help our customers find the right content for the stories they're trying to tell needs to take that into account. Otherwise, we're, we'll see biases slowly creep their way in and the models drift as we see in lots of other sort of arenas. So let's talk about the subjective side of bias and machine learning for a second, um, and how workflows need to accommodate sort of the subjective piece. So this number, 90%, what does it refer to? Well, I'm going to show you a set of image results from Getty Images. And this, these are the results that come back when you make the search for nurse. And so if you relate that to the number I just showed of 90%, it turns out that 90% of the top results that you get back for the search term nurse on Getty are of women. And you might go, okay, well, that's that's interesting um, and slightly biased, uh, certainly from a gender perspective. Um, but what's curious and probably not coincidental is that if you go and you look at the census data for the profession of nurses in the United States, you'll find that 90% of the workforce is actually female. And so this begs an interesting question, right? Is that the correct percentage? Is that the, let's call it the ethical uh, percentage? Um, and as Getty, if it's not, what do we do about it? Do we sort of you know, throw our hands up in the air and say, well, this is the status quo and this is what our customers are interested in, in sort of uh, looking at and seeing. And so therefore we're matching sort of the representative sort of distribution in society. So let's call it a day. Or is there something deeper here? Is there a case to be made for the fact that 
this is a profession that doesn't necessarily favor any one gender over another. And there's an ideal which is different from this current status quo. Um, and there's lots of systems out there where the status, we know the status quo isn't a good status quo, right? You could look at um, the fraction of women in STEM careers or the number of women in position, CEO positions, right? Where we know that there's a bias, a systemic bias that's been perpetuated for a long time. And the status quo isn't the ideal. And so we have to ask ourselves in a subjective way, but we need to ask ourselves, what is the vision for the future look like? And as a company that provides imagery that allows brands and you know, corporations to tell stories on the creative side and on the editorial side, what news agencies and media are actually putting in front of us, um, a lot of those images come from Getty how easy do we need to make it for those places to find more ideal distributions of those types of content? And so it's an interesting question that we've had to face and really tackle head on. Um, this is not something that's just gonna come naturally out of the data. So there's another problem, right? Because you might say, well, the correct answer here is to go with the customer. What does the customer want? And uh, that's oftentimes the way that that place will go is, is sort of saying the customer is always right. But what happens if your customer is biased, right? So what we did at Getty is we, we sort of um, did a little fact finding experiment where we trained a word to vec model on our search phrases that we get from our customers. So what they directly type into the search box when they are searching for imagery. So this is not influenced by the metadata that we have around our imagery. It's not influenced by the way that we structure our images or our search algorithms, purely based off of what they are typing in and what they're searching for. And as most of you know, with WordDevec, you get these word embeddings out at the end that you can sort of perform word math with, in addition to other things, like having them be inputs into um, you know, more complicated natural language understanding models that are uh, like BERT or, or other types of models like that. So we went with the simple word relationship test here. And just like the famous sort of king minus man plus woman example equals queen, right? We can do the same thing, but look for bias around terms that our customers often search for. For instance, business. Business is a common term that our customers will look for stock, for, you know, stock photography around. And so we can do that. We can say, well, let's look at sort of the masculine side of how customers, again, are searching for you know, imagery around business. And the words we get back when we make this sort of relationship check are words like CEO and salary and leadership, um, very power oriented words. And if we do the opposite, if we look at sort of what are our customers sort of looking for and searching for around the feminine side of business, and I can feel all of you tensing up right behind the screen because you know what words are probably gonna be coming and it's not the words on the left. It's these words, right? Fashion, secretary, collaboration, very different set of words, some might say biased, right? Set of words that come back um, when you look at this. And this is just the raw search data that we're getting from our customers. So if we're relying on that raw data to influence the type of imagery that we're showing at the end of the day, we're gonna be doing a disservice and instead amplifying systemic biases that exist in society. Again, something we need to consciously look into and tackle head on. Here's another example. Uh, here is the results for the search phrase wedding. And if I were to ask many of you to imagine a wedding, uh, many of you, especially that live in the United States, but many Western countries are gonna think of uh, white gowns and little chapels and, and sort of the Western style, right? Of two people uh, coming together and you know celebrating. But of course, yeah, that's just one way of celebrating a wedding. There's lots of different ways to do so. But what we noticed when we dug into the data on the search results that are coming back is that the distribution of ethnicities that we see is very different from the distribution of ethnicities globally that you would expect to see. And so what we did is made a conscious decision to and, you know, allow basically our algorithms to learn as a part of its fitness function, the distribution of ethnicities that appears more globally in our world. And we can also localize this to individual regions if need be. And the result of that is a completely different set of results. Um, we see much more diversity um, in skin tones, in uh, sort of clothing and styles. Uh, and these are just the top results, but you can see this as you go deeper in the results as well. Um, and the interesting thing here is that this actually is something that our customers 
like. This isn't something that turned them away or, or sort of decreased our business. In fact, customers love this. They demand to see more diversity, which is interesting because it's sort of opposite of what we see in the actions. And what we realize is that there's a bit of a feedback loop going on here. Customers were searching for more Western depictions of weddings, so then more of that ultimately got served up, which sort of developed this, you know, sort of let's call it, you know, confirmation bias kind of scenario, where we had those images locked in um, over time as receiving a lot of engagement. But this wasn't a question about the data, right? There, we've, as Getty, have had these images on our website uh, for a long, long time. Um, it was our optimization process which needed to be addressed. Um, so there's you know, a, a lot of interesting things that came out of this particular exercise that we went through in updating this, but the, the biggest one was really creating a vision around sort of diversity um, from the top down in the company that led us to tackle some of these issues, right? It's not something that's just gonna naturally come out of the data, um, as we've heard from other talks about how to debias data and debias the algorithms that depend on it, you really have to be explicit about the ways in which you go about doing this. So I want to spend a bit of time on some of these best practices that we've found in working on um, this, these types of problems um, over the last you know, years that I've been at Getty. The first is what I just mentioned, is that you need to create a vision of fairness um, and really stick with it. Um, you know, fairness is an interesting concept and it's subjective. Um, and it's something that uh, doesn't come about naturally as I sort of introduced early in the talk, whereas humans, we tend to get into positions of comfort and kind of stay there. And so when sort of we find ourselves in a position where we need to change and we identify ways in which we can sort of be better, um, it helps to have a plan and a North Star so you know which direction to keep going when the road gets a little bumpy along the way. I don't think this is a controversial point anymore. It, it may have been for a while, but hiring diverse teams, and this doesn't just include diversity along ethnicity and gender and age, this also includes diversity in points of view, right? So different in data science, that means not just hiring people with CS degrees or that come from the physical sciences. Can you hear um, me? Diverse can you see points me? Somebody hopping in there? Maybe not. Testing uh, one, two, three. So diverse points of view matter too. Um, and so that's something that uh, you really need to consider um, when hiring your teams and building them out. Also using diverse data and uh, quantifying that diverse data. So the you know, we often talk about making sure that the data we have is representative and that can influence machine learning algorithms. Absolutely true. But that's oftentimes where a lot of people stop. Um, actually needing to quantify the diversity that you see. Um, this is sort of shown by the, the pie charts I showed earlier about sort of the representation of ethnicity across our searches. That's really the thing that um, you know, can, can dictate at the end of the day whether or not you're achieving your goals. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it, sort of the common phrase that you'll hear over and over again, um, is true here as well. So quantifying is really important. Another thing is that bias doesn't just come from your data. You know, it really comes from your optimization processes as well. So if you have fitness functions or you have loss functions, having diversity as a part of that, and again, if you're able to quantify your data, this is sort of an obvious next step to that, is being able to encode that into your loss functions to make sure that your algorithms aren't just optimizing for the wrong things and are optimizing for everything that you care about, which includes fairness and representation, depending on what your application is trying to do. Also, and this is you know, something that extends beyond sort of building fair applications and algorithms, but not being afraid to iterate. These are hard problems and they're challenging problems and they're uncomfortable problems. Um, these are things that as humans, we oftentimes have to get out of our comfort zone in order to uh, improve and tackle and have conversations about. So iteration is the key to succeeding here. Start simple. You know, identify the areas where we can improve and, and just start making progress. Um, realize that we're not gonna be perfect. There's gonna be some mistakes, but realizing that those mistakes are coming on the way to building a better, more just, more fair systems that everyone can benefit from um, is a noble process that we should take pride in. So don't be afraid to, to get going and, and iterate. 
Also, you know, changing your perspectives on using open source data sets. Um, one of the things that we've noticed, but it's not just us, this is now becoming very well documented, is that many of the open source data sets that uh, machine learning and AI practitioners have used over the years and has really led to, among other things, the explosion in this field, we know that they have biases encoded in them, whether it's the fraction of images that are male in face recognition or of different ethnicities, or whether it's the way that labels pertain to certain individuals in the ImageNet data set. Yes, ImageNet has lots of biases in it, and we still use it as a benchmark for a lot of the computer vision work that is, you know, and research that's constantly ongoing. So we need to take a hard look at whether or not these, you know, what these open source data sets should be used for and what we should sort of actively move away from, um, or just be more committed to making them more fair. And there's lots of groups that are tackling this. And so, th but this is something that we all should be aware of. And it's something that we ran into as we built out our own algorithms uh, within Getty. And finally, I think don't feel like on your road to building uh, sort of more fair applications that you need to sacrifice accuracy or performance. In fact, quite the opposite is true. By making your algorithms more fair, by including diverse data um, and diverse points of view and hiring diverse teams and doing all of these things, the ultimate uh, thing that will happen that you will see is that your accuracy um, will improve and it will actually get better. Uh, your customers will love your products even more uh, than they do. And so don't feel like adding in this additional constraint is going to constrain you. In fact, it's going to make things even better. So at Getty, we, we know sort of the power of imagery. And I'm, I know many of you on the call today are, are you work with images. You work, use them as training sets. You um, have them as part of your products. Um, images are powerful. They uh, are one of the sort of purest forms of communication that we have. And um, people can digest a lot from a single image. The classic phrase of an image is worth a thousand words. Um, it's worth more than that, right? Because people see themselves in the visuals that they encounter on a daily basis. And uh, at Getty Images, we know that we're providing those images that ultimately wind their way into advertisements, into social feeds, um, and into the news that you watch on a daily basis. And so um, we know that representation matters. We know that people want to see themselves in imagery and we need to make them easier to find. And so you know, we've created this vision of fairness for, for our own products and services and search. Um, and one of the things that we've discovered is this has only made our products stronger and our customers even more committed um, to using this types of imagery. Um, and in the process, influencing others around the world through the use of that. So uh, with that, I think I'll, I'll take some questions, um, but I really wanna thank all of you today for um, joining in. Um, and you know, I know this is a quite sensitive topic, but I'd love to hear any thoughts that, that you might have or questions you might have on, on it. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. Fantastic presentation. If any of you have questions, please submit into the stage chat. Address them to Dan so we know that those are his questions. We do have one. We've got a question here from Xinyan Li. Dan, interesting talk. What open source data set do you use to test your model to reduce biases? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we use a variety of open source data sets, but ultimately um, we have, we've found a lot of biases in them. And so it winds up being difficult to trust many of them directly. So we spend a lot of time when we're working toward debiasing algorithms or building sort of more fair evaluation sets. Oftentimes we wind up building a lot of custom sets ourselves because of that. Um, so it's a, it's a tricky challenge because oftentimes the open source sets are the easiest to, to get access to. Um, but of course, I can also say that I'm fortunate to work at a place like Getty where we have a lot of images that we can use in house. And so we rely, of course, a lot on that data as well, which we build and sort of into these evaluation sets that do have a more representative distribution. So, um, you know, we, we sort of use both where we can. Excellent. And we have a question here. This is the last one in our time slot. Uh, we have a question from Vinod. Very interesting talk. Thank you. When including reference distributions, for example, world race distribution in wedding search, 
in model optimizations, what kind of governance measures do you recommend to make sure that the references themselves are accurate? Yeah, that's a good question. So maybe I'll, I'll answer it like this and say that, you know, the, ultimately the goal of using a reference like that um, is not to sort of match the reference directly, right? It's more to have the reference influence the direction in which we head. Um, and of course, the reference itself, you know, for instance, the distribution of ethnicities around the world might not be the right distribution. Um, we might find that, in fact, um, that doesn't work for certain regions or even globally, that isn't the best scenario for our customers in terms of what they want to see, um, even though it's sort of broadly more representative. And so this is where we sort of do a lot of testing and iterating into what those best sort of distributions and, you know, look like. So we use them more as sort of a guidepost really in the directionality, but knowing that any one sort of reference point is not necessarily going to be the best or the most optimal. Um, so it's a, it's a, you know, a give and take there. And, and we sort of realize that there's going to be noise and error um, and potentially, you know, some, some non-optimal um, solutions along the way, but hopefully we can test and learn quickly and, and see sort of which ones are, are giving us the best path forward. So um, it's a great question though. Thank you, Dan. Irina has submitted a question, but we're gonna to have to take it offline to stay on track here. We do have our next speaker standing on deck. So Dan will continue to answer your questions in the chat. And I thank you very much, a fantastic presentation, Dan. Everyone stand by, I am going to reconnect so we can bring our next speaker on board. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.